Good afternoon. Hope everybody's having a good day. Today I wish to pay tribute to a man who was a wonderful friend and mentor, Dr. James Leo Garrett Jr. This is a copy of his funeral program uh, one year later. James Leo Garrett Jr. was a Southern Baptist scholar and teacher who combined evangelical fervor with deep erudition and yearnings for Christians worldwide to find common ground. He died on Wednesday, February the 5th, 2020, in Nacogdoches, Texas, at the age of 94. For many decades, he unabashedly promoted Southern Baptist educational institutions, publishing houses, foreign missions, ties to global Baptist, and formation of a lobbying arm to preserve separation of church and state in the United States. He was, though, uh, first and foremost, a trainer of ministers, and I am one minister who was trained by him. With exacting high standards, he sought to expose students to the broad sweep of Christian history and appreciation of how the church beliefs developed and should be sifted in modern times. Dr. Garrett personified the best of Baptist scholarship, far more than two generations of Baptist leaders in the U.S. and around the world said Preben Vang, a New Testament professor and director of the doctoral ministry program at George W. Truett Seminary in Waco. Dr. Garrett was a native of Waco, like I am. He spent nearly half of his life, however, in Fort Worth. He immersed himself in the teaching and research as a systematic and historical theologian at the same time that the Southern Baptist Convention grew into the nation's largest denomination. Uh, he exalted as membership soared and Southern Baptist commissioned more foreign and home missionaries. In recent decades though, he and his late wife, the former uh, Myrta Ann Latimer, were pained by developments in church and society as Southern Baptists fought over biblical inerrancy and U.S. culture grew more secular. In the late 1940s, the Garretts became teammates in the quest for Baptist identity in the context of the wider Christian world, he recalled in a 2005 lecture at Samford University in Birmingham, Alabama. It was a wistful remembrance, however, because he believed the residue of a hugely influential movement among some Baptists in his youth called Landmarkism, which opposed ecumenical outreach, still had its effects. The denomination frowned on Christians with different practices of baptism and communion. In effect, decades of Garrett's work to engage in respectful dialogues with non-Baptists were tossed. He saw them as necessary to heed Jesus' fervent pre-crucifixion prayer in John 17 for the unity of his disciples. On the other preeminent issue of his youth, race, he grew more sanguine. Like other Protestant denominations, Baptists split over slavery before the Civil War. Unlike some others, Baptists did not reunite in the 20th century. The um, Baptists, Methodists, and Presbyterians all split over slavery and became the Northern Baptist Convention, which is now American Baptist, and the Southern Baptist Convention. Among the Methodists, it became the Methodist Episcopal Church and Methodist Episcopal Church South. There was also a group that didn't want to have bishops that broke off and became the Methodist Protestant Church. 
1939, the three Methodist groups came back together to form the Methodist Church. And in 1968, they merged with the Evangelical United Brethren to form what's now called the United Methodist Church. Presbyterians did not, ha they'd had the sense not to use Northern and Southern in their names. The Southern Presbyterians became known as the Presbyterian Church U.S. Northern Pre Presbyterians as the United Presbyterian Church USA. And the the two groups came back together in Atlanta in 1983 to form the Presbyterian Church USA. But if anything, Northern and Southern Baptists have grown further apart than trying to come together. And Baptists came through the Civil Rights Movement without schism. More recently, have formally apologized for once being captives of Southern culture and mores. And late in life, Dr. Garrett certainly uh, expressed approval for this. In fact, uh, he told me a story one time. This occurred in 1950. At a meeting of the Baptist World Alliance in Cincinnati. Um, another very influential man who had a great deal of impact on me, although I had never, had never had the pleasure of meeting him, was Dr. J.M. Dawson for whom the J.M. Dawson Studies in Church and State was named. And I entered the program in Church State Studies at, at, at Baylor in the fall of 1973. About a month earlier, he had passed away in Corsicana, where I live now. And he had been Dr. Garrett's pastor at one time. And they were very close friends. And Dr. Dawson that was the first year he had not graced the Church State Research Center with his presence. Uh, I regret that I never had the pleasure to meet him. I was working in Virginia that summer and so we didn't have contact. But for over 30 years Dr. Dawson had been pastor of the First Baptist Church of Waco. And Dr. J. Newton Jenkins, an African-American pastor, had served equally long or longer as pastor of New Hope Baptist Church. The two men were friends during their time in Waco. By 1950, Dr. Dawson had left Waco to become the first executive director of the Baptist Joint Committee on Public Affairs in Washington, D.C. At this meeting in Cincinnati, it had been several years since the two Waco pastors had seen each other. Keep in mind, this is 1950, <clears throat> four years before Brown versus Board of Education. And so uh, the Civil Rights Movement hadn't even got off the ground yet. Integration was still a long way off. The two men, Dr. Dawson and Dr. Jenkins came up and embraced each other. And this had Dr. Dawson, pardon me, Dr. Garrett saw this as a very significant event, even though he was only 25 at the time. He, uh, in retirement from uh, their post at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in New York, where he taught theology, and his wife headed the library serials department. They helped promote the growth of an interracial congregation, Meadow Ridge Community Baptist Church. And this was a very happy experience for him. As an aspiring young Baptist minister in Texas in the 1940s, he was troubled by interpretations of scripture that were used to justify the mistreatment of African Americans. In 1962, as a faculty a member of the faculty panel that invited 
Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to lecture at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. He and his colleagues rejected intense pressure for the invitation to be withdrawn. At the then comparatively liberal Louisville Cemetery, a cemetery Seminary, as the 1960s wore on, he emerged as somewhat conservative. Now, this was a long time before the fundamentalists took over the Southern Baptist Convention and got control of the various seminaries. So that was in the future. And at the time, uh, Southern had a reputation of being more liberal than Southwestern. And Southeastern and North Carolina had a reputation of being more liberal than Southern. While for decades Dr. Garrett had pursued dialogue with Roman Catholics, eagerly followed news of meetings of the World Council of Churches, he grew disillusioned. He felt the cosmic downplayed, uh, the Council doubt downplayed Christian missions too narrowly defined ecumenical success as merely accepting one's another's communion pr uh, practices and unconsciously embraced reformist political movements that justified the use of violence. On the other hand, rifts between Protestants and Catholics narrowed. I was there when Pope Paul VI ratified the document on religious liberty, he recalled in 2018, speaking of his attendance at the final week of Vatican II uh, in Rome 53 years earlier. I had really never heard of Vatican II prior to the fall of 1973. In the seminar ecumenics we had to read some of the documents and I gave reports on the document on religious freedom and the relation of the church to non-Christian religions and Vatican II has been a major interest of mine ever since then. Dr. Garrett shifted to emphasizing ecumenical dialogues with Eastern Orthodox Christians at some time, he reached out to other American Protestants, such as the Mennonites, who along with Baptists were never members of state-sponsored churches. In 2004, he was disappointed by Southern Baptist withdrawal from the Baptist World Alliance. <clears throat> I do remember him uh, speaking in our ecumenic seminar about how it had been stated that Um, Southern Baptist had never joined the National Council of Churches, contrary to American Baptist. And an argument they made uh, for that was the fact that they were an autonomous organization. Each church is autonomous, and to uh, become a member of that would have to be approved by each individual congregation. He said that argument was not valid because for years they had been participating in the Baptist World Alliance and that proposal had been never submitted to each local church for approval. And examining what he considered the best of Baptist distinctives such as believers baptism by immersion and no priestly intercessors between a believer and God. It became a major focus of his later scholarship. At the age of 65, he published two, one of two magnum opuses, his systematic theology, the first by a Southern Baptist scholar since his mentor at Southwestern, uh, Dr. Walter Thomas Connor published his in 1924, and Dale Moody, his former colleague at the Louisville Seminary, followed with his 1981. At 84, he finished Baptist Theology, a four-century study, and I'll say more about that momentarily. Courtly, unfa unfailingly kind, and deeply humble, he was unusually committed to both ac the academy and the church, recalled David S. Dockery, 
former president of Trinity International University in Deerfield, Illinois, and Union University in Jackson, Tennessee. Not only was he a superb scholar and a great teacher, but he was a faithful churchman and a person of deep and genuine piety. An exemplary ecclesial theologian with a love for the gospel and an infectious commitment to and hope for unity of the people of God. And Dockery had studied under Garrett at Southwestern and is now a theologian in residence there. While three of his five academic degrees were earned at Baptist institutions, um, degree from Southwestern Seminary in Fort Worth. He also received a Master of Theology from Princeton theolo uh, and Theological degree in 1949 and a PhD in Church History from Harvard University in 1966. At both places he forged lifelong respected friendships with Protestants of different traditions. Princeton President John Alexander As a former Presbyterian missionary to South America, he helped fuel Dr. Garrett's already strong interest in Latin America. At Harvard, church historian George Hunston Williams, a Unitarian minister's son, kindled his curiosity about the Radical Reformation, or groups of early Protestants who repudiated Rome and Martin Luther alike for relying on princes to enforce religious conformity, which they saw as corruption. It was a subject Baptist seminaries weren't learning enough about, he believed, a concern tinged with irony as Southern Baptists more recently have come to exert considerable political clout in the U.S. Baptists belong to a non-establishment wing of Christianity, he recalled in 2018. We have not used the civil powers to enforce our beliefs on others or to persecute them. And when Garrett left South Southern Seminary in 1973 to return to Waco, Southern's president, Duke K. McCall, called him an evangelical theologian. And he was startled by that remark. He said the cleavages between mainline Protestants and Southern Baptists were not stark in its formative years. In an ensuing discussion with former Louisville colleague E. Glenn Henson, published a book in 1983, Dr. Garrett decided, though, that he was indeed an evangelical. Four Baptist institutions received Garrett's most impassioned loyalty, the Baptist World Alliance, in which he and his wife devoted decades of service, Southwestern Seminary in Fort Worth, where they met and began, where he began his teaching career, Baylor University, beside whose campus he spent his early childhood, and Southern Seminary in Louisville. His father, James Leo Garrett Sr., taught accounting at Baylor. His mother, uh, Grace, Hasseltine Jenkins Garrett Key earned two Baylor degrees and eventually taught English at Waco High, his alma mater and mine. And he was a permanent president of Baylor's Centennial class, the class of 1945. Between 1973 and 79, he was director of the J.M. Dawson Studies in Church and State and professor of religion and I was the first person to start and complete an MA in church and state under his direction. In 2008, Baylor conferred on him the honor, honorary doctor of divinity degree. He was an only child. He was predeceased by his wife in 2015, survived by three sons, James Leo Garrett III of Nacogdoches, 
Robert T. Garrett of Austin and Paul L. Garrett of Austin. Four grandsons and uh, three great-grandchildren and the funeral was held at uh, Gamble Street Baptist Church in Fort Worth which is adjacent to Southwestern Sem Seminary. The burial took place at Oakwood Cemetery in Waco and of his uh, Interestingly enough, he had, uh, he was an only child. He had three sons, no daughters. They only had sons. And so, several years ago, when Tassie Ann Garrett, a great granddaughter, was born in Houston. She was the first female born in this family line in many years. Here is August 14, 1973, Dr. Garrett wrote a letter to me. My address at the time was 150 Valley Street in Pulaski, Virginia. I had got my BA from Baylor in, on May the 18th, 1973. Following day, I hit the road for Nashville, Tennessee where I spent a week in sales school for Southwestern Company. And I was sent to a beautiful Appalachian community, Pulaski, Virginia, where I spent the summer selling Bibles and other books door to door. It was quite an experience, to say the least, a very positive one. But uh, I knew I wasn't going to be back at the very beginning of school because I had to make my deliveries. With a job like that you can do well selling all summer. If you don't do the deliveries right you can lose a lot of money. And here's how he wrote me. In reply to your letter on August 10th let me indicate that your late registration on September 4th or September 5th will be quite alright so far as your graduate assistantship is concerned. You'll need to pay a late registration fee, which I understand is $5. I can understand the importance of completing your summer work. I look forward to meeting you when you arrive and talking with you about things we want to undertake during the forthcoming academic year. It had been right after. by Dr. Ray Summers and he came up to me and said Dr. Robert Miller in political science wants to see you about the church state assistantship and I went over there and got the delightful news that I had been given the assistantship that I badly wanted and so I uh, I was on the We finished out our last day of deliveries on September 1st, my roommate and I did, 1973, and then uh, the next, that was a Saturday, the next day was a Sunday, and we spent, interestingly enough, I had one customer I wasn't able to touch base with on Saturday, and I was able to deliver her book on Sunday morning early, but we hit the road and uh, spent all night uh, it was late that evening we got into Nashville and it seemed like it took us the entire day to get checked out our books uh, balancing and all that with uh, with the company and then my roommate and I took turns driving we literally drove all night one would drive the other would sleep so you know and, and September 3rd 
uh, was that Monday and spent some time at his house in ja in Russ, Texas. Then got in Waco that night and had dinner at our house and I called Dr. Garrett and told him that uh, who I was and set an appointment with him the next day. That began a lifelong friendship. I did various things as my first experience. Uh, he wasn't teaching any undergraduate courses, so I didn't do any grading. But uh, he did. Uh, I was editorial assistant for the Journal of Church and State. I did photocopying. I did proofreading. I did running errands, whatever he wanted me to do. And it was a very good experience, fall and spring. In his seminar on ecumenics, I learned a great deal wrote a term paper on the National Council of Churches, its political activities. It was not the best paper I ever wrote, but uh, I learned a lot from that experience. And got through the semester okay. Then, spring semester, I took the seminar on church and state, which was jointly taught by Dr. Garrett, who was in the religion department. and. Dr. Miller, who's the political science department. In the spring semester, I had uh, Dr. Miller for American Constitutional Law. And Dr. Garrett sat in on some of those sessions and he told, told me later he audited the Constitutional Law course because in church and state he needed to know both sides of it. He was trained in theology and really didn't know much about law, but he was able to learn a great deal. Uh, so it made sense to have both a religion professor and a political science professor jointly teaching a seminar on church state studies. And in May of 1974, I completed uh, my work, my coursework. The last thing was the master's thesis. And I got approved, I'd taken two courses in black history, another area of fascination for me, lifelong interest in I studied, uh, I had become quite interested in the Nation of Islam or black Muslims and their struggle for religious freedom. I wrote a thesis right to practice their religion unhindered. A great deal of the court cases I dealt with had to do with religious practice in prison. The right to have their medallions, their literature, to have a pork-free diet, etc., etc., and I dealt with a number of uh, black Muslims who refused to go to the military. The most famous of whom was Cassius Clay, also known as Muhammad Ali. He's not the only uh, member of the Nation of Islam in that category, but he's the most famous. And it was did a lot. I literally read everything I'd get my hands on on that particular movement at that time. I got my prospectus approved and it took me a little over two years to finish. And my dad later said that uh, when I was updating him on this correction, that correction, he observed. They really went over that with a fine tooth comb. And I was invited to, oh, well, here's, I've kept all the correspondence from that period. And my thesis on chapter five, that was the last chapter. This is funny. Dear Bob, in close, please find my copy with markings 
in black pencil, an Edwards copy. Dr. Chuck Edwards was another political science professor. I had him uh, as the he was. I had him for classical and medieval political thought in the fall of '73. Dr. Garrett was the director. Dr. Edwards was the second reader, and Dr. Stan Campbell from the History Department, under whom I had two courses in Black History, was the third reader. And Dr. Edwards made the following general com uh, comments. I suggest a rethinking of certain points, as noted in the commentary on Xerox copy. Uzzle cites Penthouse Magazine as a scholarly source. Should not a complete collection be obtained for Baylor Lang in all the chapters? Well, this had to do, this was an interview with Muhammad Ali. It was taken from Penthouse. I did not include it in the final draft. I deleted it. I really didn't think I'd get by with doing that. But it's, it was funny, and I had, had, had fun trying, you know. So, anyway, uh, the my committee members were very helpful to me. Yes, they went over it with a fine-tooth comb. But that's the way graduate research works. I later went through the same thing in my doctoral dissertation two decades later. But you learn from that process and you get things better. What you start out with may not be very good, but you correct it, you add to it, you revise it, and eventually you got a finished product that can be signed off on. Completing a project is always a good experience and Dr. Garrett ta taught me a lot about that. And uh, it asks that uh, in 1976 things were about to wrap up. And uh, I completed my coursework in May of 1974. And then in December 1974, I relocated 54 miles from Waco to Teague and got my first state job with the Texas Department of Public Welfare, which is now Health and Human Services. I was in Teague for the next two years. It was a wonderful experience, and Teague's 10 miles from Fairfield, and that's where I met my wife, Deborah. And but in, I spent a lot of time in the year 1975 and early 76 going back and forth between Waco and Teague as I was doing my job. Face to face meetings. Uh, Today, a lot of that would be done online, but you know, we didn't have the internet back then. And they were having a number of people graduating and members of the church state seminar that semester. Dr. Garrett and Dr. Miller wanted the members to the, those that were completing theses to make presentations to the seminar and um, I was scheduled to make mine at 345 on Thursday April 29th 1976 I did make my presentation that day, but not at that time. It turned out that in uh, right next door 
to the Temple Bible Building, which housed Church and State, at Waco Hall that afternoon, President Gerald Ford was speaking. And on April 23, 1976, Dr. Garrett wrote me a letter. President Ford is scheduled to speak in Waco Hall at Baylor next Thursday afternoon at 4 p.m. Members of our church state seminar want to hear the president speak. It is now being rumored that in order to get a seat, one may have to go at 3 or 3.30. Would you be able to meet with our seminar at 5 They had another presenter, a couple who had been missionaries in Rhodesia, which is now known as Zimbabwe. And then Dr. Garrett said our seminar is being interrupted by the President of the United States. I was not able to get inside Waco Hall, but I did uh, stand out on the street like so many others, and they had the equipment set up so that we can could hear the president speak and before the speech uh, I was one of many who were standing on the street and was able to shake hands with the president. I have very fond memories of that and many fond memories of Gerald Ford period. But eventually I got over to the back to the church state seminar and made my presentation. It was a very good event. So May 14th, 1976, I received my MA in Church and State at Baylor. And uh, Dr. Garrett told me uh, the day before, he said, I'd like to take you to breakfast in the morning. Sure. Uh, the, the graduation was at the Heart of Texas Coliseum, so we I uh, had breakfast at a restaurant called Sambo's, which was uh, not far from the Coliseum. It's not there anymore. And then um, August 19th, he sent me a letter saying that the J.M. Dawson Studies in Church and State requests the honor of your presence at a luncheon honoring friends of Dawson Studies. Thursday, September 2nd at 12.30 p.m. in the Gregory Room of the Student Union Building. And I took him up on the offer and did attend that luncheon. And uh, this was se September 7th, 1976. I was still living in Teague. And I uh, was... Some big changes were coming pretty soon, though, because it was just a few days after this that I got my first appointment as a pastor in the AME Church. And about six months after that, after getting married, I moved to Dallas. And that's, but I maintained contact down through the years. And for Christmas and other occasions, and we talked from time to time. And Oh, by the way, it was during the 1974 spring semester that uh, I arranged for him to preach one Sunday morning at St. Mary's Baptist Church where I was serving as associate pastor in the late Reverend Dewey Pinckney. It was about a year after this that I changed my denomination from Baptist to AME. And Well, we exchanged Christmas greetings, and um, it was in 1986 that he was going to be out of town for, I think it was conducting a revival somewhere, and he asked me to, to speak to his class, Theology of American Cults about the American Muslim mission, formerly the Nation of Islam. 
and I was glad to do that. And I, it was a, that was a very, very good experience. When I applied for admission to Baylor's PhD program, Dr. Garrett wrote a letter of recommendation for me. And he wrote a number of other letters for different things I applied for over the years, which I certainly appreciate it. And by the way, I have, it's always been a pleasure of mine to do letters of recommendations for various students that I've taught over the years. And and one of the books that was used in the church, in the seminar on ecumenics was the concept of the believers church dr garrett is the editor of this book it's a compilation of addresses from the 1968 louisville conference on the believers church and been a long time since I read it. Look forward to going back over it when I have time one of these days. He wrote numerous books over the years and his last one was Baptist Theology. Okay, here. A four century study. Very thick volume. This was published by Mercer University Press in Georgia, Macon, Georgia. And it was, it was uh, published in 2009 to coincide with the 400th anniversary. The record seemed to indicate the oldest Baptist church on record was in the Netherlands in 1609. And he dealt with Baptist theologians of various uh, groups. And obviously smaller Baptist groups didn't get as much attention as the bigger ones. But over the years, I've had a great deal of interest in smaller Baptist groups like the Primitive Baptist. Some people call them hard shells. And uh, on page 210, discusses history of uh, the primitive Baptist and some of their theology. And he writes that normally primitive Baptists have held the existence to the existence of a Succession of ba primitive Baptist churches from the New Testament era, especially through the Waldenses or the Welsh Baptist. Early on, primitive Baptist views were expressed through two periodicals, the Primitive uh, Baptist in North Carolina and Gilbert Beebe's Signs of the Times in New York. After the Civil War, primitive Baptist in Georgia and Florida expel leaders and churches for espousing <clears throat> general atonement, election as conditioned on for foreseen faith, permitting Sunday schools, receiving missionary Baptist without re-immersion and accepting Daniel Parker's doctrine of the two seeds. Late in the 19th century, a group of Appalachian primitive Baptists rejected eternal punishment and espoused eschatological univer universalism. This is a very small group that's confined to Appalachia known as the Primitive Baptist Universalist. And as the quotation, Howard Dorgan in the hands of a happy God, the no hellers of central Appalachia. And then he acknowledges me as the source, per Robert L. Uzzle. I had sent him some material from this book and he says, for the beliefs of primitive Baptist Universalist, C8, pages 86 through 99, for the early leadership of William Hale from 1838, 1906, in Washington County, Tennessee, C pages 117 to 19. So, uh, 
interesting group and I've had contact with Primitive Baptists both white and black over the years and I very much appreciate Dr. Garrett acknowledging my help in his research for his book on uh, Primitive Baptist Universalist. I say it's uh, his last systematic theology actually came out after this but this is the last ma volume of this size that he wrote and the um, And it was oh, several years ago, I don't remember the exact year, that my wife and I, Deb and my wife Deborah and I were in Fort Worth and we had lunch with him over there. It was a wonderful experience. And I've given him copies of my writings and some of my books and articles have ended up on the shelves of Southwestern Seminary, which is fine. But on a number of occasions, he told me he wanted me to do him a favor by being a fault pallbearer at his funeral. And it was exactly one year ago today. I say he died on February the 5th. It was on Saturday, February the 7th. I'm sorry, Friday night, February the 7th, that I received a phone call. I did not recognize the phone number. Normally, when I get a call from a number I don't recognize, I just won't answer it. If it's important, they can leave a message. But something told me to answer this particular call, and I'm glad I did. It was his oldest son, Jim, uh, telling me about his father's death. And I certainly put it on my calendar, and I was not going to miss that under any circumstances. So... I was able to James Leo Garrett Jr. Truly a great teacher, a great friend, and a great mentor. And he impacted so many people's lives during his 94 years. He certainly had a tremendous impact on mine. God bless Dr. James Leo Garrett. Such a wonderful legacy.